All right, well, it's noon. We will go ahead and get started. Um, I certainly appreciate that um, you have dogs barking in the back. You have kids probably um, that are doing things. My noon whistle is just going off. I live in a tiny little town that still has an air raid whistle that blows at noon. Um, we're all working from this environment. And I so appreciate the fact that you are being asked to go from a face-to-face -face setting, which you've done for years and your veterans and, and superstars at, to very quickly making this hop to a virtual setting. Um, there are school districts that study how to do blended learning for you know years before they actually implement. You're being asked to do it in a week's time. So I know that that is kind of scary um, because you wanna do it right, because you wanna serve your students. So our time here today and in the next five days is truly about you and helping you figure out the steps you need to get there, feel successful and make sure your students are still learning, all right? Um, this session is being recorded. My slides, um, we will send those out at the end, as well as a feedback form. It's a Google form with four simple questions to make sure that we are giving you what you um, And again, I know people are joining. If you could make sure you are on mute as we get started here. So first, I'd like to introduce uh, myself and um, my um, helper here today. Um, my name is Deborah O'Brien, and I am the Director of Education for Graduation Alliance, and I serve as the school principal for all of our programs throughout the nation. Um, we partner with public schools and state agencies to help recover high school dropouts. They graduate directly from their local high school with their own local diploma and meet all the same credit requirements and standards, um, but we help students get to that point. And I'll explain that a little bit so you understand the role of uh, the teacher in our big um, group. Lynetta Lewis is going to be presenting with me today as well. She's a local advocate um, and meets with our students face to face. And so it has had to um, face similar to you moving from this on, on um, site setting to working with our students uh, in a virtual setting as well. Um, she lives in Washington State. I live in Washington State um, and we work with students all over the nation. So this webinar series, again, is meant to help you with some very specific things that you'll need as you um, transition. Today, we're gonna to be talking about building community because if you don't have a place where students feel like they belong and are a part, um, attendance is really hard in a virtual setting. Sometimes it's hard enough in brick and mortar. Um, so we're gonna give you some ideas to think about as you build a community um, for your students. Tomorrow is gonna to be actually delivering instruction asynchronously and synchronously. Um, and our teacher mentor and our math teacher are gonna help um, deliver some of those ideas. Wednesday is assessments, formative and um, summative assessments. Thursday, communication and outreach to the masses, as well as individuals. And then Friday, we'll wrap it up with how do you create that teacher presence, your own personal, um, who you are and what you are and how do you put that stamp on virtual settings um, where students might not see your face or hear your voice all the time. And there are ways to do that. Again, I want to um, explain the role of the teacher at Graduation Alliance because we're gonna have different people coming in each day. Um, and if you understand what the role is, it will probably be helpful. So at Graduation Alliance, we take the role of the classroom teacher and we divide it into four very distinct groups um, that have a streamlined focus. The first is um, local advocate. Our local advocates actually meet with students face to face on a weekly basis in a group setting. Um, they are solely focused on making sure there are no social or emotional barriers that get in the way of students' education. So all that social work stuff you do as a classroom teacher in amongst uh, teaching, we have one person who focuses on that. The next person on the team is an academic coach. They're in charge of pace and progress. They actually have a more day-to-day 
relationship, even though it's a virtual setting, they're the ones who are making sure that students are getting on their computers, submitting their work, and uh, working this into their life. I like to call them the nagging big brother, big sister, uh, because that's what they're doing. You know, as a teacher, you're nagging students to get things done, to do that assignment. And so we have a staff member who's completely devoted to that. Um, curriculum is next, and Dr. Jeff Kissinger will be talking about um, creating assessments on Wednesday in a virtual setting. Our curriculum is proprietary, and our teachers are the subject matter experts and work directly with that curriculum department um, to design online courses. And then finally, that leads to our actual classroom certified teachers. Uh, they assess student work. They reach out to students um, for specific individual intervention. And again, April will be here tomorrow to explain that. So four different pieces to do what you do all day long uh, in your environment. So by the end of the session today, I'm looking for four targets. Number one, um, you should be able to identify some classroom things you do now in brick and mortar that will help you build community in your new virtual setting. You're going to compare these practices and see what similarities there are to online so you can make that transition easier. Um, identifying practices that can be applied in a virtual environment. And then finally, I'm going to leave you with a list of technology platforms, applications that you might want to look into um, in the next day before we have our session tomorrow um, that will help you to make some of these leaps as well. What I want it to be is tactical and practical. So I'd love to spend a lot of time on pedagogy and online learning and all our theories, but you don't have time for that. Um, but if in the coming months uh, we want to join into that kind of conversation, we certainly can. All right, building community. It really is all about starting with belonging. Most of you are probably familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, our students have just moved into a home setting. In Washington State, we'll probably be sheltering in place in the next 24 to 48 hours. We're going to make the assumption, although it's probably not 100%, that the majority of our students have their physiological needs met. They have food, they have shelter, um, you know, they're being taken care of. And that physically they're in a safe environment. I think emotionally it's hard for a lot of people right now that that environment is safe. Um, but actually school is going to provide a part of that safety as well, just knowing they're still connected to that caring adult and their teacher. So what we really need to move on to is how do we create a sense of belonging in your new classroom environment? We're gonna focus on three things. Number one, roles. There are roles that are going on in your classroom environment, some of them purposeful, and some of them, it's just how things evolve. And I'm going to challenge you to think about how do you replicate that in this um, different setting. There are routines that you have in place that the purpose are really about connecting students to each other, to themselves, and to the larger group to belong. Um, so we'll highlight some of those routines that you see in your classrooms. And finally, planning for relationships. There are about four different relationship types in um, the classroom that we want to then be able to move over to um, this new setting that you'll have to begin with. So first of all, roles. As a teacher, in a minute's time or a day's time, you move through a few different things. Number one, even though we don't want to be that sage on the stage all the time, there are certainly times where we are front and center directing students and giving direct instruction and, and content delivery. So there's that piece of it. There are times when we're the facilitator. We're at the edges, we're asking questions to keep our students thinking and moving forward towards learning. And then there's times where we're coaching. Um, we've delivered the content, we've set students off to attempt uh, some sort of concept. And at times we have to pull them aside kind of from the side or from the back and point them again in a, in a um, new direction or the same direction with some intervention. Um, so think about your classroom setting and how many times you might be switching between those things um, during your time. 
We also need to think about the roles that students play. Um, you can divide these up into a lot of different uh, synonyms, adjectives is the words I'm looking for. But, but think about this. You have students who are very independent. They want you to give information, then leave them alone. You have students who are dependent. They may understand it the first time, but they want to hear it five times and they want their hand held. Um, you have students who are competitive. Everything is a contest and everything needs to be gamified for them to be interested. You have students who are collaborative. Um, they can understand it on their own, but they really get energy in working in a group. And then probably most important are your avoidance. These are the students who, if left to their own devices, will sit at the back of the classroom um, and try and go undetected. And I'm sure you can imagine that in this type of a setting, um, you have to plan for those students and keeping them at the front of the class um, because you don't have the luxury of your eyes seeing them, um, you know, putting their hat on or kind of um, trying to hide. All right, so we have our roles established, now routines. I want you to just pause for a second, or I'm gonna pause, and I want you to think of the routines you have on a daily basis or during your class period that happen that create community. Here are a few that I thought of, and you probably have others. How do you greet students? When they come through the door every day, are you standing at the door? Are you at your desk? Do they gather around you? How does that work? Because that's one of our first things we do. Um, there are clear rules that are established about how we treat one another. And sometimes that's something that is throughout a year. And sometimes you're giving expectations for the next activity and how we're going to work with one another, pair up, uh, that sort of thing. We have a lot of connections uh, through commonality and Lynette is going to talk about that and they actually change when you're delivering from your home environment. Um, things that we can talk about and have in common might be the barking dog that I had to put in the pickup truck so she doesn't interrupt me. Um, we as teachers, we're focusing and monitoring relationships all the time in intervening both to support and help relationships start between students, um, as well as, you know, monitoring things that aren't going so well. And then there's student directed activities, uh, both formal and informal, that help to build relationship. So roles first, routines that happen in your class, and then finally relationships. And although these are no brainers for you, um, it's important for us to be thinking, how do you support and manage these um, from a systematic way? Whereas in our regular classroom, they just kind of happen because our eyes are on them. So first, we have individual relationships with students. Um, how I speak with one student may be very different than how I speak with another and the things we talk about. We have small groups. You know that group that comes in before school even starts and they play Connect Four in the corner, the things that you go over and talk to them about and just connect are different than maybe the ones who are um, you know, playing that paper football thing um, in the other corner. Think about how we speak to the masses. So when we're speaking to a group of students, it's more formal, it's more succinct. Um, it may be brief and more directive. And then finally, you know, students come to school a lot of times to see one another. That's their primary focus. So what are you going to do to organize times for them to do that? Um, I am going to pause for a minute and I am going to launch my poll because I'm logged in from another device so my polling is inactive. All right. We will skip that then. You also have to be very flexible in an online setting and um, plan that some things aren't going to work well. Luckily, my feedback template at the end of the day um, will capture those polling things as well. So next, I'm going to give you about 60 seconds to jot some down some ideas. Um, Wait time is really hard when you are 
conducting something virtually. As the leader, you have a tendency to cut people off short because it's awkward um, and you can't read people's expressions. So one thing I do is if I'm hosting a faculty meeting and um, people are working on some sort of reflection or um, a task, I always set a timer for myself. So I'm going to set a timer for 60 seconds. And I want for you to quickly walk through or work through these three different ideas. First of all, I want you to make a list of five routines you use in your classroom right now that build community. Then I want you to think about yourself as facilitator, leader, and coach, and give yourself a percentage of uh, which ones you are on an average day. And then I want you to think about the personality roles um, that are identified on the right um, and just start jotting down students that you think might fit into those different groups. Again, 60 seconds, you might not get all the way through it. This is certain, certainly something I would encourage you to um, continue this afternoon in preparation for tomorrow's setting. So here I go, 60 seconds. All right, I have just sent you a chat. I would like, um, I would like for you to list five routines you use in your classroom in the chat. So if you could chat those in right now. We'll give just a few seconds for those to get uh, logged in. And then what I'd like for you to do is look through the list, find uh, another participant who has similar ideas, whether it's one or all five, and uh, post something on their chat, send a chat directly to them. All right. So, you know, obviously I'm trying to do some things here and just model um, different techniques or applications within Zoom and you'll find those in the things that you use too, whether it's Google Classroom or Meets or um, Remind. <clears throat> There's a lot of things that you can utilize. 
um, within the technology you have at hand. So hopefully you'll have a minute there to connect to, the, to one another and start some conversations um, and meet your peers. Um, I am going to move along uh, to Lynetta. Again, Lynetta is um, a local advocate. So she's that person who's managing emotional, social, barriers within our students uh, in the Washington School Districts that she supports. Um, and she has had to make this leap from that face-to-face -face meetup, I get to see my students, uh, to trying to manage in a virtual setting. So, Lynetta, I will pass it over to you, and hopefully you can unmute yourself. Oh, I found her and it's not letting me unmute you. There we go. Okay. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. Can you turn your volume up just a little, Annette? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So, um, as mentioned, I uh, do, we are an online program, but I do the face-to-face -face piece. Um, and I think um, it's been great just that uh, I'm there on a personal level to um, Lynette, it sounds like we lost you. Did you hit the mute button? Um, are feeling the pitfalls. <laughs> so those are just in general. Um, it's been really hard to uh, switch over just because I love face-to-face -face time, especially being online as it is. Uh, it's harder to um, get to know students, uh, build that rapport. You can't really see body language. Um, it's hard to circulate around the classroom um, and just, you know, with students individually. Um, sorry, I'm really trying to speak up here, but for some reason my microphone is very low. Um, so anyway, I think um, some of the strengths I'm finding is just that students are um, feeling the security of being online. So they're by far um, more, uh, I don't know, they're feeling more confident in having conversations or sharing, or I've really experienced some uh, fun sense of humor, uh, things that people may not want to share um, on, you know, a, like just in a regular classroom setting. So uh, moving on to onboarding students, I feel like um, it can be a little difficult because you don't always get to meet with all of your students at the same time. Um, I really think that just being, uh, very well, um, very well prepared. Um, I think just being able to have a cheat sheet for students with all of their uh, login information, with all the websites you may be using, passwords. Um, in this case, we seem to be using a lot of links. Um, and I think that just communicating that out to students' learning styles, uh, it may be a paper copy, email, text, um, whatever works for you. Uh, onboarding also, I mean, sometimes for students to jump online can be stressful for them. And I think just doing a practice run is very helpful. It may only take a minute or two, but um, just to dispel that fear. Um, and then, you know, if you could just do that one-on-one -on -one, um, with them, I think, uh, yeah, onboarding is a little tricky, but I think that um, just being prepared for that, you know, all the tools that they need um, will be helpful. So the next part um, that um, we wanted to talk about was just how to make that leap. Um, so some of the things that were talked about already is how do we greet our students? Um, in this case, again, it's a little bit different than a high five at the door of the classroom. Um, so when we're on uh, 
line like this, I think, as we saw earlier, that doorbell keeps going off, which can be um, frustrating. But uh, just when I, when, I, when somebody pops in, just acknowledge their name, um, you know, so they're feeling like they've, you know, been seen in this case, um, you know, and maybe just starting off with a fun little uh, icebreaker or something, just making sure everybody's kind of ready to go. Um, finding common thing, uh, things in this new learning environment is really important. Um, we talked about earlier, I believe it was the, the dogs um, barking in the background, but I think that um, that's been something that we've definitely <laughs> done in my experience. Um, you know, there's things that we can share being at home versus being in a classroom. Um, for me, it might be you know, my dog again, or a hobby, I can show things that maybe I couldn't carry into the library with me um, or wherever I'm meeting with students. So it's a little bit different in that way. Um, managing side conversations has been difficult to begin with. Uh, we're using um, different programs that sometimes it's harder um, to, to manage that because we're all in the same, uh, you know, basically speaker or whatever. Um, and so being able to have backup communication, whether you're um, working with students who uh, can text or you can uh, use your, you know, Google chat on the side or especially if you have to have maybe a private conversation with a student um, in our area, it's high school students, and so there are any of those. But just having a backup plan for communication, um, uh, which goes into the circulating part too, it's so hard to do this. Um, for me, normally in a setting, I can walk around and um, chat with groups or encourage conversation or collaboration. Um, but in this case, it's a little bit more difficult. And so you're checking with um, each student individually to see um, how they're doing, again, acknowledging uh, people, um, checking in on tests and things like that. And for me, that would look like maybe a screen share or something as far as um, you know, following up the students who are testing, that there's also going to be those hesitant students, which kind of goes together with that. Um, and for me, I'll have a list of students who are online and then just checking in with those that are not maybe engaged in the conversation. Um, as Deborah mentioned, the ones who, you know, sit in the back, uh, it's the same type of deal. And so just being able to um, check in with those students, and if they're not responding and are on mute, um, uh, yeah, just, just sending them a text or uh, a side message if they don't want to um, uh, speak on the microphone. <clears throat> All right, thanks, Lynetta. I know that um, that practical real life experience um, is helpful and we can certainly um, connect any of you with with Lynetta to talk through things individually as well. All right, so you, the last thing I want to bring up for you are just some technology ideas. Again, I'm not endorsing any of these. These are just a variety of things that that we use. Um, and our teachers use and local advocates and academic coaches. So some of you may have heard of Remind before. Um, Remind is a great platform to be able to text large groups of students or small groups of students with similar messages. So if you have a class announcement, um, you can get all phone numbers and parents as well um, and send out announcements. Um, Google Voice accounts are interesting. You can get a Google Voice account. It gives you um, a phone number that you actually use through the internet. And although you might not want to speak to your students voice to voice, um, you may need to have an individual way to reach out to them. The other great thing is you can text through this application on your computer and then all that texting is um, recorded. Um, so if you need to go back and relook at conversations that you've had with students, that's available there. We use Google Meets a lot because we use the Google platform. Um, that's what Lynette has been using for her um, meetup um, sessions. And then Google Classroom. If you have um, Google Classroom already as part of your school district, um, it's a great resource to be able to um, post different assignments, lessons, links, um, 
And if you have a Google Classroom person who is a specialist in your district, I would become their very good friend. Um, because once you get a Google Classroom set up, it really um, can be a very easy way to communicate with students and record their work and have them submit their work. Flipgrid is a great fun thing uh, where students can record themselves. I know my son and, and his music teacher, um, she uses that sometimes for their practicing. So he practices his trumpet and he can submit it um, in that way. We're using Zoom today. So Zoom is a, a great platform. And I believe right now Zoom is offering free um, access for teachers. And then good old Skype. Skype's been around for 10 plus years. So um, was one of those beginning platforms. So just some technology ideas. And what I'd have you do is research those. I put up some YouTube videos for your, that will explain how to use them. Um, so that as you prepare for the next um, sessions, as the week is to come, you will um, you will have some ideas on how to deliver the different ideas that we will be giving you. So um, we're we're exactly at 30 minutes, which, which is what we said the session would be. Um, and I was aiming for you to identify skills for you to build community um, and then compare those practices to how we might move them over to online settings um, and identifying those that could be applied in a virtual environment and then identifying a technology platform to deliver communication. So I hope that's been helpful for you. I would like to open up to um, q and I know with so many of you, um, we'll see how this works. We can use a variety of the chat box um, or you can unmute yourself and ask some questions. Um, if I have answers, I'll give them. If not, I'll write them down and we will certainly address them uh, more fully in our sessions to come. Questions? All right. Well, if we'll see. Okay. Uh, Cheryl says, I'm concerned on how to deliver instruction to some of my special education students. Um, very good. So we will be talking about asynchronous and synchronous um, delivery options tomorrow. So I think that will give you some ideas. I will tell you that we run a school um, in Ohio um, that is blended. Uh, where students come to campus for part of the time and they're online at home part of the time and all their special education um, <coughs> services are delivered online through Zoom. Um, so we can certainly um, talk about that specifically too. Let me see here. So a great question. Several of my friends have been doing this for a while, but only have 50% in participation. How do we reach out to those that are not only or not maybe attending? Um, I, that's going to be the biggest struggle is how do we get students to come to the setting? Um, Many of your schools are probably making sure that students have computers and connectivity. So once you've overcome that hurdle, how do you have them logging on? On Thursday's session, we're going to talk about mass communication and individual communication and different strategies. So I think that'll probably be helpful. But really starting with the community building is what I would advise. You know, maybe even having students <laughs> attend for a short session where you do some sort of icebreaker um, and you have them start to connect back to you and back to their peers um, in a very purposeful community building setting. Um, my second graders can't type fast enough to ask questions before the end of teacher wait time. That um, is certainly a, a digital barrier and you know it it depends on if you're having synchronous sessions that are live and voices available and managing, you know, muting, unmuting. Um, but I will certainly record that question as well. Let me get in a second. 
Um, I have a struggle who, I have a student who will struggle to use a computer. A lot of you are probably going to um, have to address that connectivity and how do they even access and um, coming up with ways to connect their parents and all of those pieces will certainly be a hot agenda item. Um, I don't have, you know, specific advice for that, um, but we'll note that one as well. And Rachel, I'm assuming that you are writing down um, some of these questions as well. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. How to address students who are kinesthetic learners online. That asynchronous synchronous session um, could certainly address some of those pieces. So Tuesday's session um, would be a good place to address that. Are we going to be responsible for students who do not participate? That is probably an individual district um, decision. You know, we are district, I'm watching even in Washington State where districts um, started out by saying we will move to online, um, you know, this will happen. And as they start to run into some of these questions, now, you know, they're, they're going back to the drawing board and saying, you know, how can we count that there's um, equity here, that there's equity in access? Um, if we have such a large population of our students not attending. So I definitely think that your districts and your schools are going to have to tackle some of those um, issues and make decisions. How do I get parents an email address so that I can communicate with them all? Um, that'll be a great session on Thursday. So ways to do that mass um, communication. And I would imagine, it, you know, it depends on the state, whether it's power schools that you're using or Skyward, but there's those things are certainly hosted in your school um, information systems. Um, so we may need to make a list of questions that you take to your school districts and see where do we even start with access. Um, a concern in California is that some tools, Remind being one, have not agreed to our state student data agreement. Are districts in other states dealing with this? That, that's an interesting question. I know that in Washington State, um, we do use Remind and um, <laughs> both at Graduation Alliance and I know in the districts that, that live close to me, we use that, so I'm not sure, um, but we'll note that question. Um, Remind is also a free program. It does not work. Um, thanks. Blooms and Free is free and it has not been working either. Um, hey there, this is Crystal Bell. Um, so kind of just along some of the questions that are happening, like with Blooms, I know that they updated their program so that it can um, hold more users. So it's supposed to be working now. I haven't had any problems since they updated it. And then um, this might be a question for um, Tom Thompson as far as that for um, our school district, Ocean Beach School District. But I feel like all students, regardless of what grade they're in, have access to their Google accounts through um, Ocean Beach School District. So they should have, they should be able to get onto Google and use Google Classroom and whatever other programs they have their information like automatically sign in through Google to, they should. <laughs> um, and then my other question, and then this may be covered in a later class this week, but will there be like a suggested schedule? Because I know we're not gonna be like seven hours of video videoing our, our students, but like, um, is there a suggested schedule for what we, for how long? And yeah, I guess, I guess that, yeah, you know, um, that's a great question. And it's so different dependent on, um, you know, grade levels, age, um, supervision, who can be helping you to stay attending. Um, I think one, th so no, I don't have a great suggestion, uh, okay. but we can certainly explore that. I think one of the things that we're gonna start noticing is the difference between seat time and um, competency. So, you know, students have to come to school and attend so many hours, so many minutes in a day. And during the next few months here, I think we're gonna see more and more where we need to deliver content 
and assess whether their students have it or not. And that idea of having to be logged on for so many hours a day to prove learning um, is going to be really hard to manage. Yeah. So I, I think it's a bigger question in how will we be sure that students have learned materials? Um, and, and again, that's going to really change um, dependent on the grade level that we're talking about, the type of content and so forth. So I don't have a great answer for that, but it's, it's something that is going to evolve, I think, greatly. Okay, thank you. You bet. Um, thank you for the presentation. Do you think that we will need to check those that are logged on and report for FTE's attendance? Um, Craig, that's a great question and that's going to be specific to your district and your state. Um, again, it goes back to that seat time piece. I think we're going to be in a time where there might have to be some give and take um, in funding compared to learning. Um, so those are things to come. Um, this is Lauren Keller. Can I yeah. talk for a second? Yeah. I'm with Ocean Beach School District and my experience has been with fourth grade um, that their Google accounts are not enabled at home. In order for them to log in as Google students with their student email, which is non-functioning outside of our server, they have to have a parent or a person at home who has an account with Google, and then they are able to be a sub account to the main account. So if a parent has a Gmail or has a Google account, in the upper right corner, there's a profile dot. And if the student clicks on that profile dot, a drop down menu will happen that says manage accounts and there's a button that says add a new account. The student can then put in their email address. They're, they have to put in four letters, four numbers, and then at oceanbeachschools.org. And then it'll take them to the password and they have to enter and I don't know what grade it goes down to that the QR codes happen, but QR codes will have to be changed. And you'll have to do that under the server umbrella at school as a teacher. So you have to go to school in order to get on I am and change those logins. So the password is then put in and then the sub account happens, but a parent or a person who can have a main account at that device to Google has to be there before the kids can log in. May I make a comment? Yeah, absolutely. I, I do believe that that's related to the Internet Privacy Act, and I'm pretty sure that our tech guys will do anything to help us, but in this way that they're inhibited by the fact that if a student is underneath the age of 13, it really has to have parental consent regardless. Interesting. Yeah, I'm sure that, and I think there's a lot of you from Ocean Beach on this, and uh, it's fun to have you. So you'll probably need to reach out to tech and figure those pieces out. It's interesting because uh, in the school district that my son goes to, which is in Washington as well, um, he has Google Classroom, and somehow he seems to be able to access from all of our different devices but i don't know if that was something i did originally you know three four or five years ago or or what but it certainly is um once you get all those pieces figured out it, it can be good you know we're talking about um my um, chief officer of operations fernando uh, moreno he is watching as well um and he's talking about we should probably add some tech um webinars for all of you um, we have an incredible tech team that's what our delivery platform is built on um, and these are questions that they may be able to get some really good answers for so we are recording sure hi this is amy huntley i'm the superintendent of ocean beach um, and yes most of these tech issues are ones we're thinking of on the back end um, if we go to full online, we'll be addressing all of these. So feel free to send those questions my way. Very good. We also are writing all these 
questions down. So we will be analyzing all of your needs and figuring out what what we can do to help or, or point you in the right direction. You know, I would I want to um, clarify that we know a lot about online learning. Um, we've been in this space for quite a long time, um, but we certainly are not the experts on everything. And our purpose here is to give you some ideas to make the leap and then help you find those resources when we don't have answers. So we definitely want to be a hub um, to help help with this whole uh, transition and movement towards something new. All right. Any other burning topics um, that come to mind? So again, what we'll do for follow up is we will send all of you this recording. We will also send um, the slides, my slides here, um, a form so that we can get your feedback um, and add to our webinars as we go. Um, and we just look forward to, to working with you and gaining information and learnings from all of you as well. Um, it's a tough time, it's an interesting time, and really equity and making sure that all of our students have access to their education is going to be so important um, to make sure they're learning along the way. So with that being said, we will sign off for today and everyone stay safe. And if the sun is shining, go stand in the sun for a few minutes um, and be supportive of one another like I know you will be. Have a great day.